Good morning. I hope you're awake. And um, today we're going to talk about scratch logs and uh, scratch logs pools specifically. Um, I don't know if you heard about it, used it already. We'll uh, come uh, in details. And uh, today I'll present with, uh, with Jeremy, developer at XI, and uh, I, um, Salesforce tech lead at Aviv Group. We'll have um, a bit of context about uh, Scratch Logs first, then we'll see uh, a theoretical solution and practical solutions. Then we'll be able to dive deeper into the open source solution and see how we can integrate it. We'll finish showing that it is future proof and with a quick with a quick summary. I'll let Jeremy start with the context. Thank you, Nathan. So let's start with a, a bit of context to see what are Scratchorg. So Scratchorg are environments uh, for source-driven deployments of self-force metadata and data. Uh, they are uh, full configurable. You can use a Scratchorg configuration file that you can see here. So you can uh, edit the edition of the Scratchorg. Uh, if you want to use the preview during the previous time, you can uh, uh, use it. Uh, you can uh, add some features like community service cloud if you need to use it uh, in your scratch log and some settings uh, like uh, omnichannel. So it allows to emulate a different Salesforce edition and uh, it's nice to, to use. You can also install package and deploy data for testing and it's, re it's represented by a uh, S-object in DevHub. So that means that you can uh, deal with it and manage it uh, more easily. Uh, in the just develop. So let's compare to other sandboxes. So um, contrary uh, to other sandboxes, uh, for example, uh, developer, developer pro, partial and full, um, it's not uh, refreshed from your uh, your production. Uh, as we see with uh, the file, uh, the scratch configuration file, it's uh, fully configurable. Um, if you look at the data storage, uh, it's like a developer, uh, but uh, on file you just have uh, 50 uh, megabytes of, of file. Um, and uh, we can't talk about refresh because it's not uh, a copy of the production. So, uh, how it is to work with a Scratch org? You have several commands that you can do. Um, to create your scratch org, you have the, simply the SF scratch org uh, create uh, scratch, where you define your definition file um, and your target dev hub. Uh, here, a little uh, GIF to illustrate it. You can also push your, your metadata in your scratch org with the SF project deploy start, which uh, can uh, work uh, easily. You can retrieve metadata with uh, simply uh, SF project uh, retrieve uh, starts. You can uh, take, uh, for example, if you create a field in your Scratch org, you can re directly retrieve it uh, locally with this command. And finally, if you need to work with data, you have different way to, to deal with it. Uh, the vanilla command avec uh, SF data import tree or export tree. You can also use some um, SFDX or SF plugin, like uh, the TXA1 or SFDMU. You can use data package, uh, some ESV or the API. So uh, now we uh, saw all uh, the, the, the property of Scratchorg. Let's see how we can use it. We can use it for development because they are highly and uh, easily configurable. Um, it's isolate and ephemeral, ephemeral environments, so uh, it's uh, up to date and generally uh, from uh, your uh, repository. It's quick to create, empty, and to delete. Um, it can't reduce code conflict because uh, in the main uh, framework, uh, all developer has his own scratch org, so you don't push uh, and uh, delete some uh, code from your colleagues like on sandboxes. And it's comfy with production environments if you customize uh, it well. You can also use uh, Scratchorg for uh, testing. 
uh, it's a clean testing environment because uh, you can create it from scratch and uh, you know exactly what there is in. Uh, it facilitates continuous integration for deployments. Uh, it promotes agile development practice. There is uh, no long-term commitment, so if you need to test uh, some uh, feature, uh, like uh, omnichannel, you can add it to the Scratch org and you don't need to buy it in uh, production or install anything. It's uh, completely easy to use. And again, it replicates uh, the production environment. But be more than that, uh, there is some limits of Scratch org. So it's a manual creation. It can be time consuming if you need to push all your metadata and data on it. Uh, the config can be tricky sometimes. Uh, you need competencies to automate it, uh, automate it, uh, some things on it, uh, like uh, scripting. And there is a maximum uh, SO available for a DevOp, as we saw in the previous tableau. So how to address those painful points? And I give the micro to. Yes, let's go to the solution and the theoretical solution first. Um, we talked about scratch logs and in the title you saw that we talked about pool. Um, I'll help you visual visualize it uh, a bit. It's like a swimming pool but with less swimming and more scratch logs. Um, first, we can imagine the scratch logs as a, as a ball, a playing ball. For, for using it, you need to, to find it, to inflate it, to make sure it's the good shape, the good size, ready to, to use, so it takes time, and there's a lot of limits, as uh, Jeremy said. Um, let's now think about um, a pool full of these balls. They are already here, ready, inflated, beautiful. You just pass by, grab one, play as you want, and then uh, you can send it back to the pool when you're done with, uh, with it. That's the main idea, that's why we call it a, a pool. And a pool of scratch logs lays on, uh, on five pillars, five main um, advantages. The, the first one, and maybe the most important one, is pre-created, meaning that a scratch log in the pool is already created. You don't have to worry about the creation process, the configuration process of it. It's already managed by the pool. Second one is that you want to be you want it to be on demand with just one click somewhere, one command line to do. And it needs to be fast because if you have to wait three hours to be able to use it, there's no no need of a, of a pool. Fourth pillar is uh, recycling because um, we love the planet and uh, we want to be able to send back a scratch song inside the pool uh, by resetting to to basic configuration or by deleting it and then the pool will re re regenerate it um, itself. And uh, last but not least, uh, up to date. It's uh, very important to have uh, square chunks up to date, so you limit the deployment um, delta you, you have every time when you push or, or pull changes. We'll talk a bit about how it works to, to refill a, a pool of square chunks. First, let's imagine a first pool with um, four uh, scratch logs already here created and uh, two uh, scratch logs not created because our oh, pool size is six, for example, and uh, a second pool of four already all created. So when the, the pool logic run, it will check if there's empty slots on the first one. Yes, there's two empty slots. In the second one, no, there's no, no empty slots. So the next step uh, will be to refill empty slots by creating just the needed amount of scratch log at the right place with the right configuration. So we don't recreate 10 scratch logs, just the two missing ones. That's how we will be efficient. Um, little talk about recycling. Um, there's multiple ways to handle it and strategies you can have with it. You already know that square chunks have um, a lifetime, so they always automatically delete after a set amount of days. But sometimes you want to force it to be more aggressive on it, to have more up-to-date data and the metadata on it. So let's imagine again all two pools, but this time we have four 
existing Swachong but not used, and two Swachongs already in use by developer developing, and a second pool with one Swachong used. The, lo the logic will simply delete unused Swachongs, and um, the used one will stay um, here, so the developer can continue developing on it. And because we deleted them, the refilling will come by after and recreate them only the, the needed one. So all this um, solution have quite some advantages. First, it's completely automatic. You have uh, nothing to, to do by yourself. It's available instantly and uh, on demand with just one click. And there's no competence needed to use it. Um, and you can, as we saw, have specific pools, as many as you want, and with specific use cases, with specific configuration on it. The idea is that you want to be like that with your pool. You just sleep happy, and you know it's working well. Developer can get the squad shocks in a few seconds, and uh, everyone is, uh, is really happy about it. It was the theory. Let's let's talk a bit about practical solutions, and we have uh, multiple solutions. Um, the first solution can be a, a paying tool. Um, there's quite some advantages on it. It's easy to set up. It handles basic use cases, and there's user-friendly interfaces because we know the product team works hard on it to make beautiful things. But of course, a paying tool costs money. It can be a bit limited on customization, and you are dependent on the vendor because um, it chooses the new feature, it chooses the feature to stop. If you want to stop the tool, you you can't use it. So, for example, there's Ute. Um, I think there's a guy from Ute on the side. Um, personally, I never had the chance to to try a paying tool for that, but I know it's working and uh, and it's a viable solution to to handle pool management. Second, second solution is to do it yourself. Um, good thing is that it's free this time, and you can customize it as you want because you're basically doing everything. And you learn a lot of things out of Salesforce by doing it. That's a good point. But of course, it's very time consuming, and you are reinventing the wheel, redoing everything yourself. Someone else probably has already do, done it, but you do it again, and you're alone against all challenges, so it's even more time consuming. Maybe you tried, maybe you succeed, maybe you failed. I don't know if uh, if you had some examples with it. And the third solution is the open source solution. The good thing is that it's the best from both previous solutions, um, and it's maintained by the community with a large group of people with dif different uh, use cases, ideas, and it brings a lot of innovation, new features that you wouldn't imagine, that a small group of people can't imagine, and more flexibility to adapt to, to the vast world. But you're dependent uh, on the community. You can be part of the community to reduce these uh, uh, pain points. And you'll have some learning curve and integration challenges because it's generally not just a one-click integration, and you haven't um, wrote all the code yourself, so you need to write some, to, to read some documentation and and understand how it works. And uh, for example, with SFP by uh, Flexible, they were previously called um, SFO script. And now we're going we're gonna dive deeper in the third solution with Jeremy. Yes, thank you, Nathan. So. If we sum up what you need to, to get a, a pool of crash work working, so you need a logic to create and manage your pool, so data management and your metadata management. Um, it's highly recommended to use packaging because it's easier to man manage uh, your, your deployment with, uh, with packages. Um, you need to uh, a logic, uh, CICD for example, or VM or uh, Raspberry Pi where you can uh, create all your logic, launch your script, and, and so on. And you also need a Git repository. So let's see an integration to an existing dev cycle using uh, SFP. 
So uh, basically, in the main workflow, you have uh, two uh, pool, di two different pools, the dev pool and the CI pool. The dev pool is uh, ready to use, so developer can take a scratch log uh, and, uh, and uh, do what they want to do uh, with it. Uh, there are uh, external dependencies installed on it. Uh, there is uh, the custom code of your org deploy on it. There is sample data and the user configuration is uh, set up, so you can start working for, uh, with it uh, unless you take it from the pool. There is also the CI pool, so there are all dependencies installed. When I say dependencies, this is, uh, for example, the managed packages like uh, CPQ and billing. Uh, you are, uh, this is uh, used for testing of environment, environment and uh, it is deleted after uh, use to avoid, avoid converted metadata. So uh, developer uh, mainly uh, in this main workflow with uh, develops their US. Uh, there is a PR review where other developer uh, ask for, for change on it or not. And if it's okay, we will try to pull, to, to merge it. And uh, before the merge, you test the deploy in CI to see if everything is okay. The other one is uh, for developers, so the dev pool. So uh, with this command, SF SFP pool fetch, uh, you chose your t with the tags uh, your pool, so the dev pool for developers. So you can uh, get attributed uh, SO and start working with it uh, in a few seconds. There is also uh, four scripts, uh, main scripts that uh, will work uh, on your on your SFP. The replenish scripted for CI and for dev. You have also a user scheduled uh, scratch logs recycler. For example, if uh, you you have you are done with your scratch log and you want to take a new one, you use it and it will delete uh, the scratch log from the pool and the next one will be created uh, after with uh, the other uh, um, script uh, replenish uh, pools. And there is also a scratch log pool cleaner. Uh, this script will uh, completely delete all your pool and recreate Scratch.org uh, up to date to, to your pool. So I let Nathan finish with future proof. Thank you. We, we saw that we have um, a solution, um, practical solution working, and uh, we want to make sure that you're not doing it for nothing and it will last even with your DevOps evolving and your Salesforce and the Salesforce world evolving too. So first, what is the future on Salesforce and DevOps at Salesforce? It can be packages, many with um, unlocked packages. It can be multiple orgs, one per country, one per company, lots of orgs. It can be more customization option in Salesforce or in your DevOps. It also can be real data in dev environments. If you want some more information about it, I made a talk about it last year, so it's on YouTube if you want. And future can also be huge orgs because yes, they exist. Um, the good thing is that it's future proof. It works with all of that and you'll be able to improve your DevOps, improve your Salesforce management with a pool that can scale up, that can follow you um, along your journey. Along your journey. Um, let's quickly summarize. There's Way more to say about uh, scratch logs and scratch log pooling. I hope it was a, a good first view of what you can do and why it is important. Um, because it's literally a game changer to have a pool of scratch logs. And the question was how it fits in your DevOps strategy. But I think the answer is that it's at the center of your DevOps strategy. It really helps you so much on it and it can evolve with your, de with your DevOps. Maybe you just have a, a big monolith and you, you can already use it. Then you'll go to packages, you'll still use it. Then maybe you'll have another hole to, to manage also. You can keep using it and it will go with you and uh, progress with you. So thank you all for, for being here. We made um, a working demo, but we talked too much, so we, <laughs> we can show it. Um, it's on Jeremy's GitHub, and here's our GitHub with our social links and everything. And a little um, 
add parts. Um, if you want to work with pull scratch orgs, packages, multiple orgs, other one that you have changing the world, uh, we are looking for a senior developer at Aviv. Uh, there's everything on LinkedIn, Smart Recruiter, and you can come talk to me or, or Fabio in the room, and the winner uh, will help you. So now it's your time to talk if you have any questions. So I, I have a question if you don't. Um, please raise your hand if you already used uh, scratch logs. With a pool of scratch logs. So I, I think maybe there's some learning you can use on your daily job and improve everything. And really, when you go to scratch logs and go to pool of scratch logs, you never want to go back. It's yes. Now we, we we don't make it run on Raspberry. We actually made it run on a lot of things. We had um, a VM on the cloud on, on a Linux that worked. We then changed to GitHub Action that works too. And now it's on SQL CI and it works. Like it works everywhere. <laughs> Just need a cron and yes. Yes, the, the question is, uh, we said that in the scratch log you can reproduce a um, production environment, but when we create it, it's empty and there's nothing on it. Do you want to answer or, or I answer? Okay. Um, yes, that's true. When we create a scratch log, it's empty, but the good thing with a um, pool of scratch log, and you can do it manually, but do it automatically because it's better, um, you can push your um, custom code on it. You can install all the packages you have on your production environment and you can even push uh, data on it, anonymize data if you want some test and all the configuration data. So you can have a, a scratch log, like dozen of scratch logs ready to use, like the production, everything up to date. Does it? Thank you. Yes? I just Yeah, um, in the um, in the JSON you can set everything yourself, settings, feature, etc. But with OrgShape it takes everything from your production org, and then you can add new things, new features uh, on it. A and some things doesn't work with OrgShape, so. Yes, exactly. You'll only have a like uh, an ID uh, for your org on, on bottom of it, and just one command and it's, it's done. <coughs> yes, last question. Um, so I, I'm, I've been using the scratch log and the custom database to adjust the launch of the particular bug with the other one and I have scratch log. So why for the pool of scratch log do you need uh, so much of custom logs for the pool? Yes, the, the question is um, you used um, scratch logs as data analyst and it creates quickly with uh, one click, and that's what we, we said. You can create scratch logs with, uh, with just one command, but it's empty. So if you want all the metadata from your org, all the managed package you have on your org, you need to install them, and it takes time. It can take a lot of time. 
So you don't want to run it on your, your computer because if you lost internet somehow, you lost everything, you have to restart for hours to, to do it. So the idea is it's online in the cloud and you, you don't have to worry about it. To, to install and configure your Scratch logs as you want. Yes, because at the beginning we were running the script locally and installing everything locally, but it takes a lot of time quickly um, with big packages and things like that. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Jeremy, for the presentation.